And welcome back to The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers, we're here each and every week talking uh, to interesting people and discussing interesting ideas, and we have an old friend back today. We do indeed. Uh, Lieutenant Governor Jerry Askins is going to be joining us, telling us what's going on at the state capitol and at the legislature's back in session, plus a lot of other things with which she's involved that I think our viewers will find very interesting, very challenging. It's an exciting time to be in the state of Oklahoma. We'll visit with the Lieutenant Governor, Jerry Askins, when we get back on The Verdict. Driving rain, blistering heat, and bitter cold. 365 days a year, 24 hours a day. Chesapeake drills nonstop for natural gas on American soil. Chesapeake drills more new gas wells than anyone else. And from those wells, collects the most drilling information and acquires more 3D seismic images, leveraging every efficiency to improve the odds of finding more natural gas every day with every well we drill. The better job we do of discovering bigger reserves of clean burning American natural gas, the greater the prosperity of our nearby communities, our state, and our nation. And as long as there are more gas reserves to be found here in the U.S., we will never rest. Chesapeake. Natural gas wins the day. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers. Kent's going to introduce today's guest. Really pleased today to have the Honorable Jerry Askins, the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Oklahoma, joining us again for another visit on The Verdict. She is the 15th uh, Oklahoma Lieutenant Governor. She's a native of Duncan, Oklahoma, did her undergraduate and law work at the University of Oklahoma, served on the bench uh, in uh, Duncan as special judge for uh, eight years, uh, spent 12 years in the House of Representatives, is now president by virtue of her position, uh, is now president of the Oklahoma State Senate, and she's back for her second visit as lieutenant governor. Governor, welcome home. Thanks. It's good to be back. Thank Glad you. You're here. A year and a half since you've been elected, two Just and a half almost. years yeah. out to the end of this term. How are things going so far? You know, I feel really fortunate. Um, it's a good time to, to be elected, certainly getting to start out and have my first full year in office be Oklahoma's centennial year gave a lot of opportunities to travel the state and visit with Oklahomans and enjoy in their celebration of Oklahoma's heritage and join in their vision of where they think Oklahoma needs to be going in this 21st century. It provided a great learning experience for me and I think a great opportunity for the state to get acquainted with their new lieutenant governor. Very few people, if anyone, get to see the state like the lieutenant governor. What's going on out there? I mean, you know, some people see a different, you know, their mm -hmm. region of the state. Very few people see all, all the corners. I think that's right, and I, I, it's been very important. And for me, I've had the opportunity from a tourism standpoint to be in McCurtain County a number of times, and which is where Beaver's Bend is, a beautiful part of the state. I've also been in the Panhandle at Black Mesa. Uh, the very far northwest corner of our state. And so you have issues in those areas that are, I think, very heavily concentrated on trying to do what they can to attract tourism to their area, which is economic development for them. And then you have areas like Hollis and Altus and, and then certainly up at Venita and Miami, Oklahoma, that are working on their own types of economic development that had challenges this last year due to flooding. Mm -hmm. Let's reflect back just for a minute on the centennial year. I know you got to yeah. see a lot of things that probably couldn't attend near everything that went on, but you got to see a lot of things. Just kind of in retrospect, mm -hmm. uh, what stands out 
uh, the highlights of the centennial year for you? For me, I, I think it started with um, the Tournament of Roses Parade on January 1st, 2007, having uh, the opportunity to be a spectator in the stands there and watch watch people from around the country, but especially even from California, really embrace and be surprised at the attention that Oklahoma received during that parade, which is truly a credit to the Centennial Commission that served uh, under Blake Wade's able leadership as well as Lee Allen Smith and Lou Kerr and others who have served on that commission as chair. But once that got started, and I think that really helped energize uh, the state at the beginning of our centennial year, there was nothing that was finer than being in Guthrie on Statehood Day. It was absolute patriotic. Uh, and, and Oklahomans don't talk about our own statewide patriotism that much, but the pride in being an Oklahoman just was bubbling in, in, in Guthrie on November 16th of 2007. And then certainly the uh, Centennial Gala, the spectacular at the Ford Center with all of that Oklahoma talent that was showcased. I, I don't know how you could walk away from there and not think Oklahoma's really moving in the right direction. The uh highlight of the parade for me was the part that was a, was part of Oklahoma's uh, entry, but the fellow with the jet pack who uh, flew up in the air. and uh, The rocket man. And rocket I, man. And yeah. I am so glad you mentioned that because I've actually talked about the rocket man a great deal this last year during our centennial because he first flew during the Tournament of Roses parade and there were there were uh, there was a young man down the the bleachers from where I was about 10 years old and when the rocket man took off he was like cool dad I want to go to Oklahoma <laughs> and 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 so if, if that 10 year old could be excited about our state we need to be excited about it as well as you travel around the state um, you, what, what are you seeing out there in the issues that we know Oklahoma has to do better in and, and that is taking care of our infrastructure mm -hmm. and, and the health issues that we face and the job creation that we face what can you present to the rest of to the, to the state? Well, I think what that you see around is clearly uh, a workforce issue, and it doesn't matter which part of the state that you're in. Um, there are job opportunities, but they don't feel like they ha either have the skilled labor there or it is needing higher level of education beyond a high school diploma, and certainly the efforts that have been underway the last number of years to try to increase uh, the number of college students as well as college graduates is critical as we try to help our local communities uh, expand existing business as well as attract new business. So I think when you're talking about economic development, you have to talk workforce, and that starts with education, whether career tech, the common schools, uh, pre-K through 12, or whether you're talking higher ed. Infrastructure is a, is a critical issue, and, and the communities that are doing well tend to be communities that have either are on our interstate highway system or they are close to it and have access. But we have other pockets of the state that if we can even give them uh, dollars to help with good state highways, there are industries that would move to areas further away from our urban communities if we have good infrastructure. So, And it's not just highways, it's also water and sewer systems because as you try to develop um, the resources that are needed for some industrial capacity, the ability to, to have the right water there or other power systems, that's the kind of infrastructure we as a state are seeing the requests come from our smaller communities. I noticed recently that you had to cast a vote in the Senate. <laughs> So tell our viewers about that. Well, the fourth week of the session is the first week for the Senate to hear their bills on the Senate floor, uh, no longer in committee work. And the first day of the session, I actually was on the Senate floor for another issue, and, and I had stayed on the Senate floor and was listening to the question and answers on a particular uh, Senate bill brought by uh, Senator Laster from Shawnee. And the bill dealt with child support enforcement. It had been brought by that division of the Department of Human Services. And there were a lot of questions on the bill. And when the vote started, I left the chamber because I didn't need to be in there while they were voting. And I got called back in because the vote tied up 24-24. So um, I, that, I was asked to break the tie and uh, title was off the bill. I think there's some questions on the bill that will have to be answered before the session adjourns and they bring the bill back, but I voted aye to keep the discussion going. Hmm. This task force that's going on on gang violence mm. that you've been named the chair of, what work would you think will be accomplished in this? Well, I know it's really an important issue to Oklahoma City, mm -hmm. and certainly the Oklahoma City Police Department and the Oklahoma County DA's office have been actively involved in this task force, as have their counterparts from Tulsa and Lawton, 
which are the three communities that certainly have the most gang violence. Um, we believe that there are good things that are happening and we need to help draw attention to those good things that are already working. Unfortunately, many of the um, um, task forces or the internal gang committees that either a police department has or the district attorney's office have been funded by federal dollars. And we're seeing some of those dollars cut back now. Whether or not we as a state want to make the commitment to help fill in on those, um, those that funding gap, I think, is part of what we can help do with this task force is show how good they're doing. Mm -hmm. And those efforts focus on intervention and prevention even led by law enforcement authorities, and I think that's been something a lot of the community doesn't recognize, that our law enforcement officers recognize the best way to stop gang violence is to prevent it from ever starting and intervene on those younger people, younger kids, before they actually become gang members. There are enhancement provisions perhaps in our statutes that we're looking at compared to some other states. Uh, so those are kind of the areas that we're working in right now as well as trying to determine if there are additional funding sources out there to be able to help. We're visiting with the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Oklahoma, Jerry Askins. We'll be right back with more on The Verdict. Okiwani is an Indian name for a place where children play. When we obtained the camp, we found a lot of oil debris left in the woods. We saw a commercial about how the oil and natural gas industry cleans up old oil well sites. We called the OERB and they agreed to remove tons of concrete and steel. It didn't cost us a thing. Thousands of children have left their footprints on this land. Thanks to the oil and gas industry, they will for a long time to come. We'll see Meyer Eatman Tate. We're accountants. We do taxes, business valuations, estate planning, and consulting. And we're right here in Oklahoma, working with the owners of small and medium-sized businesses. Steve Wilsey and Stuart Meyer have the resources and the experience. We'll see Meyer Eatman Tate in Oklahoma City and Tulsa. Welcome back to the set of The Verdict. Mick Cornett with Camp Myers, and today's guest is the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Oklahoma, Jerry Askins. Lieutenant Governor, I saw recently where you were awarded the Cape Bernard Award. Uh, congratulations on that. Thank and you. Tell us a little bit about how that came about and uh, what that meant to you. Well, it was, uh, it's an award that's presented by the Oklahoma Commission on the Status of Women. And uh, I, I was very honored. Um, at the same time, they presented two awards and uh, myself and Congresswoman Fallon had the opportunity uh, to be recipients in the same year. So it was nice to be honored by a group of women that are really working to try to help raise awareness of women's issues in the state, whether it be unemployment or employment wages, um, health issues, and I was, I was honored to be recognized by them. And we talked a little bit earlier about tourism and uh, mm -hmm. your opportunities to travel around the <clears> state <throat> and look at the tourism opportunities. Is Oklahoma growing as a state in the tourism industry? I think we are, and I think that our centennial year was an opportunity for us to showcase a lot of the uh, bright spots that we have in our geography. Oklahoma has 50 state parks, 50, but, when, but we only have five uh, lodges, five facilities that have lodges, Western Hills, over near um, Wagner, we have Roman Nose, we have Lakeview Lodge down at Beaver's Bend, Bell Star at um, 
Roberts Cave, and we have Lake Murray. And although many people are aware Lake Texhoma was closed because of, of a poor facility and it has now been turned over and sold to a private developer, that was in the works before I became Lieutenant Governor. But at Lake Murray, the Ardmore Tourism Authority has entered into a long-term lease with the state of Oklahoma and they are be uh, beginning to build a new lodge and then will renovate the existing facility as well as the cabins down there. And I think that that will begin to help put a different face on our state-owned uh, opportunities for lodging will, will actually help us with economic development. So I'm really excited about the opportunities that are beginning to develop. The legislature over the last few years has made an infusion of dollars for capital needs and some deferred maintenance that it, um, we had put off within our, our, our properties. And being able to help address those, I think, allows Oklahomans an opportunity mm -hmm. to visit within their state and then to bring people in from out of state. With the price of gasoline projected to be what it's supposed to be this yeah. summer, does that uh, envision for you uh, probably greater attendance at our local uh, state parks and the like? It is, and it's what we certainly hope, and, and as and we had hoped it as well last year, and unfortunately the floods really ruined yeah. us for Memorial Day and the 4th of July. And we have three holiday weekends in the summer, and we only really got to take advantage of Labor Day weekend, so we hope that the fact that gas is con going to continue to rise, it appears, and will be higher than Oklahomans are used to paying for, that they will use it as an opportunity to see places within the state that they have not seen. Oklahomans are our own best ambassadors. And if you know more about what's going on in your state, you have an opportunity to speak positively about it to your family and friends that live elsewhere. And really that all helps us as the mayor and others do their economic mm -hmm. development trips. Talk about the edge and the endowment and opportunity fund. It's, it seems to be uh, growing well, and uh, I think the early uh, uh, prognosis is that it's working and probably something we should invest more in. I think so, and I was glad to be a part of the legislature at the time when uh, Governor Henry asked us to create the edge endowment and then come back, uh, the t I think, in 2006 and set up the opportunity fund. The Edge Endowment is, is an opportunity, uh, I think it was recommended to give us uh, research dollars, have, have us, put us in a position to be the research uh, capital on the plains or the prairie. It was came out of the Edge Committee that the governor created, but it was recommended that we grow it to about $1 billion so that we can work off of the earnings off of that. I think only $150 million has been deposited in it so far and, and certainly with a flatter uh, uh, growth revenue this year, I think it becomes a, more of a challenge, but no less important to make a continuing commitment to that fund. It says something, I think, to business and industry when the state of Oklahoma says, we know that we have to have dollars out here to help recruit the best and brightest to come work in our state. And the Edge Endowment uh, lets us be closer on a level playing field with states that have used endowments for years. The Opportunity Fund probably ought to be called more like a fast closing fund and is a chance for us to compete with states that have dollars where the state leaders can go in to help close a deal for economic development and say here are here's money we can put in for whatever's necessary whether it's the infrastructure we were talking about earlier uh, roads or, or sewer and water systems but to be able to compete with Texas and North Carolina and California and other states we have to be able sometimes to go in and say here's five million or ten million we can do to help finish the deal that can have a lasting capital construction project that can last beyond even what that one industry might need. Mm -hmm. Well, Speaking of funds, <clears throat> let's talk about the teacher retirement system. Mm. There's uh, always news that it is underfunded. What did the legislature do last year and do you expect anything this year in regard to that? Well, clearly it's been a, a burden for a long time in that we have consistently rated it as uh, nationally as one of the worst funded pension systems in the country. And so finally last year when our growth revenues were a lot better, the legislature followed the request of the governor's office and, and created a, a higher contribution a plan that I think goes out for about 30 years where the school districts themselves increase the contribution that they are paying into the teacher retirement system. The expectation is that the state will increase the appropriation 
to those school districts so that we will actually give them the money to be able to make that payment into the teacher retirement system. That's an obligation we've got to continue to meet. It's one of the reasons why when people are talking about worried that our growth revenue wasn't you know, a lot higher than we would have liked this last year. Those are the commitments we've already made that we must keep because it affects our ability, it affects our bond rating when we, when we want to try to sell bonds for other projects and we have to be able to show that the state has a serious commitment to solving this financial issue. As a former member of the legislature, can you explain how election years are different than non-election <laughs> years in the legislature? What, 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 what would expect to come out of a legislature that was up for re-election, what would not be expected to come well, out? Well, every other year is election year for all 101 members of the House of Representatives. And it's election year for half of the Senate, so 24 are up every two years mm -hmm. in the state Senate. To me, the obvious difference is that every election year, <clears throat> it's more noisy. Uh, it's more noisy at the Capitol because you have issues that legislators want to be able to go back and run for re-election in their district or they want to be able to use issues to run against someone uh, in another district. And so it becomes a little noisier um, because, of, because of the election cycle. I think because we are heading into an election year at the same time that you now have state agencies saying, please just let us keep the amount of money we got appropriated last year. Don't, don't cut us any. We, the budget issue are gonna, is going to drive what the decisions are going to be the balance of this session. So it's not unusual for us to see in an election year a request for uh, uh, pay raises for our employees, pay raises for teachers, which uh, I think it, the governor says it's the fifth year of his five-year plan to try to increase teacher pay. So you have those issues coming up at the same time that we have this audit from Corrections saying that they need money. And I know that a few weeks ago the governor and the legislative leaders agreed to a supplemental appropriation for Corrections. The trick is to hold that into the FY09 mm -hmm. budget. So I think the budget will continue to drive what happens, the balance of this election cycle. And we're going to have to wrap it up there. Governor, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you again. Thank you. Lieutenant Governor Jerry Askins of the state of Oklahoma. Kent and I will have a final word right after this. The good life comes naturally to Tulsa, where nature's beauty is matched with an eye for aesthetics. A legacy of neighborhoods graced with lawns and landscaping and handsome homes. A place that seems to have patented an ideal lifestyle. Bank First is loyal to the quality of life Tulsa assures its citizens, to the priority placed on education, culture, and growth. Loyal to builders who transform raw land into residential charm. Developers who see opportunity and add vitality to Tulsa's economy. Bank First serves both enterprise and private lives that need a loyal partner. It's how we help nurture this city's very good life. Bank First. Loyal to Oklahoma. Loyal to you. The Journal Record is pleased to be a sponsor of The Verdict. The Journal Record. Since 1903, the best source of Oklahoma business news and legal information. We are back on The Verdict. Mick Cornett and Kent Myers wrapping up a show with the Lieutenant Governor of the State of Oklahoma, Jerry Eskins. Yes, uh, a lady that's doing a grand job as Lieutenant Governor. She's always welcome on this show. She's got a lot of duties, a lot of responsibilities, which she uh, carries out uh, uh, really well and uh, gets high marks from uh, both sides of the aisle out at the legislature. And if you want to contact the Lieutenant Governor or just get more information on her office, you can do that on the internet. The uh, email address, actually the website address is ltgov.state.ok.us. And if you have an idea of a guest you'd like to see on The Verdict, you can again go on the internet and let us know. Go to theverdict.tv. That's theverdict.tv. 
For Kent Myers, I'm Mick Cornett. We will see you next time when we'll have another guest and another exciting topic right here on The Verdict. The preceding program was produced exclusively for the Cox Channel.